Um, our next speaker is Steve Davis, and he's currently employed at the by the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot for Air Mobility Command, and he's currently working on testing upgrades for the KC-10, KC-135, and C-130 aircraft. Um, he has a master's degree in aerospace engineering and systems management, and is involved in the National Space Society, and um, he'll be speaking today about a modular space station architecture. Can you talk more before you're ready? Okay. Dance as we speak here. Um, realizing that we're uh, under a fairly tight clock here, this is going to be a fast and furious presentation. There are copies of the slides, the one I'm going to be talking about in the back there, so if you want to have a, a hard copy to follow along with, you're more than welcome to do so. If you want to just kind of hang with me for the next 20, 25 minutes, uh, I'd certainly appreciate it. Let's dig right into it. Um, as you walk around the uh, conference, Notice that uh, some people are wearing the, uh, the t-shirt, I want to go, in fact it's for sale down in the exhibit area. And that is the emphasis. Uh, what we want to do is use tourism as a catalyst to develop the infrastructure of lower orbit. This way we can start doing other endeavors in space. So why am I choosing uh, tourism? Well, a study done in 1996 by uh, um, Yesowitz, Pepperdine, and Brown, 1,500 families, found that 7.5% of these families would be willing to spend over $100,000 for a trip to space. Now, they also said that this applied to uh, 130 million people who took pleasure trips of over 75 miles in 1996. Well, if you take 7.5% of 130 million people taking the trip of a lifetime, say once every 75 years, you're looking at 130,000 people who are potentially willing to spend over $100,000 a year to travel to space. That's a very large market. If we could have a small percentage of it, we'd have a viable business in space. Now, when I was looking around for this presentation, I wanted to bring some kind of model to it, how I could judge my uh, particular resort concept. And one that I found was the best is a cruise industry. The uh, cruise ship industry goes away from your land-based infrastructure as a semi-autonomous type of operation, much like you can have in low-width orbit, bringing accommodations, entertainment, uh, food, and travel all in one package to the people. Now, the kind of facilities you're going to see on board these state uh, cruise ships are going to be a state room anywhere between 150 and 300 square feet. Uh, they're going to have sleeping quarters for two to five. They're going to have uh, individual uh, bathrooms, closets, lock boxes, TVs, telephones, individual thermostats, and a few other amenities depending on how much money you want to spend. They also provide, as a common facility on the ships, dining room, lounges, uh, theaters, ballrooms, gyms, libraries, pools, all sorts of good stuff. And these are kind of things I'm going to talk about in the resort today. There's one other thing that the cruise industry does, is that caters to the people. It's not just accommodations, it's the crew. And I found, as you look at the cruise industry, uh, there's typically a set passenger to crew ratio. And that works out to about two and a half to one for the good cruise lines. So on a cruise ship that has, say, 2,000 people on board, you can have 600 crew serving those people. So I adopted that for the space station. Now, I realize that in space there are things that are they're just not on a cruise ship, and vice versa. There's things on a cruise ship that aren't on space. The assumption was that they're offsetting. Now, there's one other thing the cruise industry does, and that has a parameter called uh, displacement per passenger. It's how many tons of your ship per passenger. What it is, it gives you a feel for how much space each person has on board the ship. Similarly, in space, we're looking for habitable volume per passenger. In essence, the key to having a good resort is having enough space so somebody can stretch out and have a little bit of personal space on their own. And that's very key. So how do we get that volume? Well, there's a couple ways. Uh, the tin cans we have right now we're launching just don't have enough volume per launch module to make it really a cost-effective type adventure. Some people have uh, proposed using the uh, Space Shuttle external tank. It gives you lots of volume, but unfortunately it gives you engineering problems, and now you have to, on orbit, build your resort. Fortunately, NASA has done something for us that's very nice, and that's creating a trans -hab. And what it does is it gives you a lot of volume on orbit and puts all the engineering on the ground. What I'm proposing is to take this transept that NASA is working on right now 
and derive it to make it more suitable towards the uh, resort type industry. First, extended the length, uh, extended a little bit to where it still fits on current heavy lift launch launchers, but uh, gives you more habitable body, more revenue space. We're looking to make money on this. Uh, both tunnels are on this. On the current uh, NASA version, the tunnel, one of the tunnels is blocked with the inflation equipment and other support equipment for the transit. We're going to leave both in open so people can travel all the way through. Uh, we're going to increase the life support fourfold. Right now, Transat supports six people. I'm looking to rent bump up to 24. I'll admit, it's an arbitrary number. Uh, further design may say that within the constraints, we can't have that many, or we can have more. Uh, 24 is just derived from how I arrange some of the rooms later on. You'll see that. Uh, more windows. One of the great things about space is the view. And if you can't give the people a view, they're not going to go. So we're going to add a lot more viewports to this. Uh, I've got two on the Transat. I've got some designs that have upwards of 12 and 14. The limitation is going to be structural. Uh, how many you can put on this before you start compromising your pressure vessel, and also safety. How many can you put on before you get away from the micrometeorite shielding you get from the transect shell to these very vulnerable ports? There's six variants of this. The first one of which I'm going to talk about is crew orders, the crew have. Now, here's where I get to pull on my laser pointer and start waving my arms. Uh, you see here what I've done is actually made the uh, I took, if you, anybody familiar with the Transab knows that it has six crew quarters in the core. I eliminated that. I moved the crew quarters outside because that's where the space is. So what we've got is 18 rooms uh, arranged on three levels inside the uh, Transab shell. You've got six rooms per level. Like these are the crew. We're not giving them luxury accommodations. Uh, access through corridors up and down outside the corridor. Now, in the original Transab, the crew was in the, in the core and they were surrounded by a water jacket. It gives a radiation shielding. But you've got to remember the original Transab was also conceived to take people to Mars, going through the Van Allen radiation belts. This resort is a low Earth orbit, zero G resort. So we're not talking a whole lot of radiation. You can probably get rid of, rid of that. In the baseline design, I did. You can add it back by having, say, some polyethylene shielding around it, maybe a water bladder and add some water. It, it's possible to do that. Like the original Transat, we've got a crew exercise area along the bottom. The concept for this is you've got, got the crew in the orbit six to eight months. What you want to do is you want to reduce the cost of transferring the crew up and down, because that costs money. Leave them in orbit, but if you can do that, you've got to supply the exercise for them so they don't like, come back on a wet noodle. Uh, similarly, on the bottom level, you've got four bathrooms plus a shower for the crew. Um, and in here, on the second and third floors, you've got all the life support equipment. This is where you house everything. The maintenance concept for this is everything's accessed from the tunnel inside. You can see the little tunnel there. So you don't have to go into the rooms to disturb the guests. And we're going to try to standardize that to all the modules. The first guest module uh, is the fancy one. This is eight suites on four levels. So you uh, basically have uh, two rooms of a suite on it on each level. Each one's approximately 175 square feet to be searched. Uh, Squishing that out to cubic feet, you're looking at 1,400 cubic feet. So you've got a lot of personal space for these people on board. You've got a living room here, you've got a bedroom here, you've got a bathroom there, and you've got a shared shower. So there's a lot of amenities here that are very, very similar to the cruise industry. Uh, once again, you've got your life support equipment stored in the core. Next slide, and what I'm going to give you is a cutaway of it. So you've got to get a better layout of what the, the floor plan looks like. Here's the corridor that goes up and down the outside of the shell so you can access your room. You go into your living room here. Uh, over to your, your bedroom here, up in the bathroom, sort of a changing area, holding area for the shower here. Uh, you've got your toilets, one for each suite, and then you've got a shared shower. Uh, every room has certain amenities, and these are things that are going to make it attractive to people who spend 100 grand and become limited space. Uh, one, you get a viewport right here. You can be able to look out on your own without anybody disturbing you uh, at the wonderful view of Earth. You get an entertainment center. Uh, music, phone, TV, internet, data, upload, anything you can imagine that we stuck on, uh, across the video wire, we can bring it in here. And plus, you get an adjustable thermostat. Now, this is nice because some people like the rooms hot, some people like the rooms cold. It's one of those amenities the cruise industry has, we're going to make it in here. We've also got storage closets, a personal storage closet for the people, and then we have a household storage closet there. Now, uh, next slide. For those people who don't want to pay for a suite, we're going with a slightly cheaper version here. Uh, what we've done is we slashed it up into 12 rooms on three levels plus a bottom common bathroom level. Here, instead of having a suite, you've got a single, single, single room. Uh, it's approximately 75 square feet uh, piece. That's about 600 cubic feet a piece. Still plenty of space when you consider the transhab. Give people 84 cubic feet of space, personal space. So we've done a lot here to give people space. 
The cruise industry, ooh, that's a good question, and it's going to look pretty horrible. Uh, the cruise in, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, the cruise industry, like I said, is anywhere from uh, 75 to, uh, uh, well, correction, 150 to 300 uh, square feet of floor space, 8 feet tall. So you're looking at about 2,500 cubic feet of space for people. So we're, we're one of the quarter of that, uh, about half that would be deluxe suite. So it, it doesn't quite make it, but it's getting there considering this is an orbit and that's on the ocean. Um, this one has community bathrooms, one of the ways you can save space is to start sharing things. Uh, six, six toilets, one shower, and if you want to get with me afterwards, I'll discuss why I put so many toilets on board. You got two in the bottom, you got two on each of the second and third levels. This makes it close to the room, so people don't have to travel down this 40 foot hallway to go uh, take, a, take a leave. So, we have one shower on the bottom level. It's conceived operationally as a one week stay, and I guess we're just going to let people get a little bit funky. Uh, it's just one of those compromises you have to make to start locking equipment into orbit. Once again, the uh, support equipment is in the core. Now let's start moving away from the accommodations for people and start taking some of those common rooms I mentioned in the cruise industry, like the dining room. Uh, the dining is for 24 to 36. Uh, this is going to be limited by life support, or perhaps we can, with the interconnecting modules, plumb things in to start uh, pulling the life support from other modules so it's more more people. You've got 12 tables on three levels. Uh, you've got four per level, conceivably running two per person. The good thing about this is these tables just go down, attached to the core module on a track. Disconnect them, moving together, instead of having four tables for two, you can have one table for eight, so you can accommodate larger groups. Very flexible, and very nice for folks. We're uh, using, if you look over in this view, uh, you've got the front half where your guests are sitting, you've got the back half, which is actually the galley. Uh, we're using ISS right, galley racks. We've got two refrigerators and a galley rack on each of the three levels. You've got a pass through so the crew who is running in the galley can move up and down without disturbing your guests. You've got a large dry storage area to store all that food. Um, the operational concept for this is you're going to have folks on the ground select their menus. You, you can't have a buffet in space, you can't afford that much waste. So you're going to pick your own menu so you don't gripe about the fact you got lousy food and you picked it. Um, but we're going to have the crew prepare it and serve it. One, that's keeping in with the uh, cruise industry in terms of service. You want to make your guest feel pampered, feel served. Now, I guess there might be a few who want to do it, but the other reason why I like that they have crew serve is because it reduces accidents. Uh, people just aren't used to living in zero space. We want to make a mess out of the entire space station because somebody spilled their orange juice. So that's why it's food prepared and served. Uh, you can't have a space station, you can't even have a, uh, a uh, cruise ship without having a lounge. You've got to have some place to go and relax and, uh, and play around. It's very similar to the dining room. We're trying to standardize this stuff to reduce costs. So instead of having 12 tables, you've got 11 tables, you need a little bit more room to work things. You've got two large screen TVs, one here, one there. Um, this is great because when you're not showing movies, you can show data. You can show the, the station's orbit. So if you're flying over the uh, Gulf of Mexico, they can look on this and say, oh yeah, here's the Gulf of Mexico. Float over the viewport and find out, hey, that's where I live. There's Houston. It gives them a way to mentally put together where they are in the orbit by what they're seeing on the ground. Because sometimes it's very club, very hard to do when you have a lot of cloud cutter and, oh, geez, what's on down there? This gives you a really neat way to do it. Plus, historically, you can say put up John Glenn's orbit. Uh, give you a connection with the past. Say, hey, I'm here, John Glenn flew right down this little orbit right here. So it's sort of a connection with the past. On the bottom here, we've got a gift shop, snack service, hey, we're trying to get money from people. Uh, second row, you've got a toilet. Uh, you can also buy postcards, so you can send somebody a postcard from the edge. Uh, I don't know if I can get the post office to let me have a postmark up there, but we can try. Um, on the second level, video games. Uh, for the kids, for the adults who feel like it, you got to have some recreation up there instead of just looking out the viewport. They're going to get terminally bored. So we've got video games and other zero G games. Can anybody imagine ping pong and zero G? It's something that kind of makes you go, hmm, that's going to be a fun game. Or how about Twister, the old classic uh, kid game, a Twister and zero G. Well, I can get pretty interesting too. Um, there will be those people who, given, having afforded $100,000 trips to space, are going to want to gamble a little bit. So you put a few uh, video poker games up on one level right here. If you don't want to play poker, you push another button and bingo, you're now in the uh, ship's library. What do you book? Uh, something like that. You can have a card table up there somewhere, too. Top level, we've got the medical clinic. Uh, you're going to have people who get space sick, despite the fact there are medications we can give them. And somebody says, I don't need that. And come up and like, lose your lunch, and then have you go. They can call to the medical clinic and they can get cured. You're going to have inevitably somebody who's not used to zero G spring off one wall and they'll crash. And 
into something else. You're going to have spray needles and stuff like that. We take care of this. We have our own onboard medical plan. Um, one of the big things about space is the view. The other thing is zero G. You've got to play, play around. So we got a gym module. Opens up three levels, as open as you can make it, to still be able to support the people with. 26 feet long, 25 feet in diameter. I'll give you some sort of uh, measure of this. This podium is only about 25, 20 feet across. Tack it on a five feet long. That's how that's the diameter of it. 26 feet long, almost back to the second set of tables there. Uh, another way to look at this is uh, the um, Skylab was only 22 feet across. I don't know how many of you remember the videos from Skylab. The astronauts running around with flips and rolls and tumbles. That kind of thing. This is a lot safer though because you don't have all that experimental equipment to bump into. Bottom of we have ex exercise equipment for uh, any of those ambitious people who want to go out and exercise. Have a report down there so you can actually look out where you're working out. And of course the bathroom. Launch configuration. The great thing about Transhab, you take this big volume and cram it in a small space, you can launch it on conventional boosters. I lengthened it um, to 15.3 meters. It's about three meters longer than normal one. Four and a half meters in diameter. That fits well inside the launch envelope for the uh, long shroud on the Airing 5. Weight-wise, you can launch this on the Airing 5, a Proton, or either of the upcoming expendable, uh, evolved expendable uh, launch systems. Now, I looked at this, and how much did NASA say their trans was going to cost? I figured those numbers are wrong. Tag on three more zeros. It's uh, $100 million to $200 million a copy. How do you put all these pressurized modules together? You have a truss structure. Uh, once again, we're using inflatable technology. Uh, you've got inflatable tunnels here. Internally to that, you have the support structure. That's the backbone of everything. You've got six ports, one on each end, pressurized. Pressurized port here and three on your central module. You've got two unpressurized ports, one on the bottom and one on the bottom of this inter intermediate docking area. You've got all your equipment in this bottom area, your batteries, your computers, your guidance and navigation control, your station computing computers, your attitude gyros, your batteries, all cranked in this space here. Um, you've got station keeping uh, jets on each of the end caps and in the intermediate docking area. It gets complicated when you start making very large stations to keep energy control, so there's going to be a lot of redundancy here. And for the first one, we're going to wrap some solar panels on here and give them some autonomous capability. Once you get further down the line, you have somebody who's already in orbit on an operating station. You can get rid of those, but initially you have to have that. How do you get something like that in orbit? Well, you package it. You take it, since you're inflated with tunnels, you fold the whole thing up. Uh, you cram it in, once again, to an area of five. It's 4.6 uh, meters in diameter. And once you look at this, it fits once again within the, uh, the fairing of the area of five. 13 half meters long. You tack more, three more zeros on this. And, is being very optimistic. It's two, 200 million to 250 million dollars, about 30,000 pounds. Um, I stole a lot of stuff from the International Space Station. I, I had no desire to make up new technology. I'll let the government pay for the money to develop this stuff and I'll just uh, co opt it for commercial use. Uh, observation level and the airlock are perfect examples of that. Uh, if you've ever seen the cupola that they're designing for the International Space Station, this looks like one that they put on steroids. A little bit bigger. What you want to do is you want to make it large enough to get a whole bunch of your people in there because they're paying for the view. Let's give them the view. About 12 people, 30 million bucks a piece. Airlock, same way. Operationally, you're going to have to have some way to maintain the exterior of the <coughs> So you have to have an airlock to improve the law and maintain it. But if you're going to have an airlock and you've got these paying passengers there, I'm sure there's one or two that have a DD pocket who want to go on an EVA to make that the highlight of their orbital excursion. So we may have uh, guest excursions going out with one of the crew members to pull around the outside of the resort. Uh, anticipated cost on this is $150 million. Now to power all this, you're going to need a power module. Uh, anybody who's seen the uh, space station recognizes this immediately. That was a deadlift. In fact, it's the same size dimensions. If I could, I'd steal the mechanism. Uh, it folds right here. Uh, so your truck folds in half, this collapses down, folds in half, and jams all inside the fairing of the current heavy lift launch booster. Once again, we're trying to do this on conventional launch boosters. Um, I already mentioned the solar panels. If we get solar dynamic by the time we actually get to this, you just rip this off at the gills here, throw your solar dynamic on it. Uh, power conditioning, once again, stolen right off the ISS to condition the power from your panels. Uh, you've got your thermal coolers, once again, stolen right from the ISS, uh, providing thermal cooling. This is size, so it can cool four pressurized modules, three of the trans have and one of the uh, trusts. And then you also have a little bit extra in there to uh, provide cooling for the power conditioning conditions. And the little blue thing right here are thrusters. Uh, it gives you thrusters on a boom, so you can start using more beer more effectively, much like they do on beer with their current thrusters uh, setup. 
I took a wild guess. I don't know how much it's really going to cost. Uh, given what the uh, station's paying for their solar panels, I just guessed it up $250 million. I'm throwing these out for a baseline a little bit later. How do you put this all together? Uh, right now, the space station is using three different types of ports. MS and space station, three different types of ports to put it together. I don't want that. We want one port that everything docks to. Uh, there was a presentation made yesterday by James Lewis uh, from NASA that's on your CD-ROM. I encourage you to do a look at it. He called it LIDS, Low Impact Docking System. This is a great way to put stuff together, and it works right within these uh, with, with these ports. We've got two guys. Pressurized on pressurized. Pressurized two meters in diameter, 1.3 meter square passage. You've got internal connections, so once you dock these things, you have a complete system. All the utilities are all hooked up. You've got your human passageway, you've got internal, internal connections for water, wastewater, uh, air, cooling, data, audio, video, power, and oxygen. Everything you think to go on, plus a little bit of growth there, sort of things I just didn't think about. You've got an unpressurized version, the same thing, much simpler, lower cost, just for getting things like fuel on board, coolant. Same mechanisms and same design as the pressurized board. So how do you put it all together? Well, when I first thought of the concept, I thought we make everything all automated. Each module gets equipped with its own uh, gui guidance system, its own rendezvous system, its own maneuvering system. Uh, you know, autonomously launches it, the thing guides its way over to the station, assembles itself, inflates itself, and all you have to do is send a passenger to start making money. Then I started thinking, by the time you get launch costs cheap enough to put people in the space where they can afford a resort, it's almost cheaper to put up an astronaut. So you end up with two types of assembly. Automated assembly, which I just described, ground controlled automated assembly. Each module is taking itself to the station and docking. Um, there's two systems that are currently under development. We can use that the advanced space provision system that uh, NASA is developing for the International Space Station, or we can use the Soviet radar docking system, Kuris that they're using right now on here. Either one of those will work just fine for the automated type of system. But with the manual assembly, you, you launch a couple of astronauts in a tug, you launch your module, they go grab the module, drag your over and put it together. It's great. It's cheaper to do that if you get the launch cost for people down to a reasonable level. Um, now, the last thing here, docking your birthing. Docking is where a module under its own power goes in and assembles itself. Birthing is where you get the astronauts to grab it and take it in. Why am I concerned about this? When you start putting this together, there's a couple modules that have to dock on two ports at the same time. You can't do that with the APAS system. You have to have such closer velocity, you're not going to be able to dock both. So you end up birthing at that point. You end up using something like the common birthing mechanism that they use in the International Space Station. The good thing is that low impact docking system I just talked about can simultaneously dock at two different spots with this. It's a smart system. It's really neat. I encourage you to look at that. So let's put it all together. Let's start talking about uh, an actual resort that's put in one piece. This is the smallest practical configuration. Seven modules already with six launches. Limited facility. What you've got is you've got your uh, toll room, guest cab, you've got your crew cab, you've got your airlock, you've got your truss, and right here you've got a lounge. What we're using is double the lounge is the lounge, dining room, and rec area. So you've got limited facilities here. You can still get up, you can still start making money. That's the key right here. Uh, 30 guests, 12 crews. Volume 1,570 cubic meters, compare that to the completed International Space Station, only 1,200 cubic meters, and you start realizing just how much volume these transats can give you. Uh, per guest, that gives you about 50 cubic meters per guest. NASA did a study that said for a one, one week to a month stay on orbit uh, in a commercial configuration, you're looking at anywhere between 10 and 20 cubic meters. We're giving them 50, so this is great. This is a nice configuration. Cost on the estimates I've been talking about throughout the thing, anywhere from 930 to 1280 million dollars for the modules. Launch cost 480 to 840 million dollars. If you go over a 10 year life cycle cost, maximum occupancy, that makes a per night cost for a room on this station of 13 to 20 thousand dollars. Kind of high. We're working to get it down from there, but that gives you an idea of what you can do with this. Even with this cost, we're talking two million dollars to put this in. Over a 10 year life cycle, you're only talking to $13,000 a night for a room in space. The great thing about this kind of design, it's flexible. Right here is the one I just talked about. That's that one trust have for 30 guests. Well, if you look at move over one, there it is, the same thing. What I've done is I've added other modules to it. I've now got 96 guests. Well, let's take this one, the same module, move it right here and add more to it. I've got 384 guests. That doesn't include the crew. This last one, you're talking over 500 people in space. Now, the neat thing about once you start to get these larger modules, it's flexible. However you want to put this thing together, 
unlimited, basically by your imagination, by your budget, by whatever the, uh, the traffic can hold. We just have this large volume in here. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's talk about first that, that second one, that 96 guest one. It's a, what I call a free app. I call this the smallest complete station. 18 modules already than 16 launches. You've got a diner, you've got your lounge, and you've got your gym. Everything is there for the people need. And we also threw in another observation boat, so we now have two of those. Um, anywhere from 80 to 96 guests, 80. Uh, if in this notational one, I put two of the eight room suites and two of the 12 room uh, guest tabs up there. So if you just want two person per room or suite, you got 80 people. If you max out the live sports system, you got 96 people. 36 crews on board. Next slide. So let's start talking uh, some of the other part. If I go with the low end a guest that uh, I had from my class, we're talking uh, 2.46 billion to put in orbit, a launch cost of uh, 1.28 billion dollars. Cost recovery, 10 years, once again, max occupancy, uh, per night stay, $11,000. We're starting to get this down. I mean, this is the key. We want to get this down where people can afford it. Volume, uh, 4,650 4, cubic meters. This thing is huge. Uh, per guest, we're down to 48, and that's because some of the uh, common modules are now being shared by more people. 5,500 guests per year, and that's based on seven days and six nights in orbit. Now, if you remember when I first started talking, I said that the Yankovic study said we could get potentially up to 130,000 people willing to spend 100 grand to spend a trip in orbit. If I can tap 5% of that capacity up there, that potential capacity, we can now fill this thing up max capacity for the entire span of its life. So how much? Okay, let me give you a notion, notational thing. All the investors and all the people want to know the bottom line. I don't care how fancy your resort is. If I can't afford it, I'm not going. Uh, package price. Here is the target package price. It's not what's going to answer cost. 100 grand per person to block it to. Who's one week ground training, so that way they can get used to the differences of living in zero G, and one week in orbit. Uh, this includes the launch cost and logistics. Now here is one thing that's going to kill us. Right there. Anticipates $100 per pound for personnel cost. I can put the station into orbit on current boosters at a cost of about $1,000 to $2,000 per pound and still make it profitable. But I can't get the people there unless it's down to about $100 per pound. So if you wipe out the launch and logistics cost, you're looking at a cost of being in orbit of $5,000 per person. Ooh, we said $11,000 in the last slide, so how are we going to do this? Well, uh, we're going to look at, so look, it's $5,000 to look at $107 million orbital revenue per year. Uh, capital cost of the station, about a billion dollars. That's a 60% reduction in price. Well, I base my estimates on development costs on what NASA said it takes to build some of their modules. So we're going to make production of this. We're going to have tens of units. These are not custom units. They're tens of units. You can amortize some of that development cost, drive down those costs to, say, $60 million a copy. We're not talking less than a million dollars. We're still talking $60 million a copy. Basically what you're paying for a 737 fully equipped these days. Uh, same thing with the launch cost. We're trying to arrive the launch cost down half a billion dollars to launch this thing, about $1,000 to $2,000 a pound. I think it's doable, especially with the evolved expendable launch vehicle. So enough of the money. Let, let's have some fun here. Um, you saw the previous one that had that big space in the center. I also had three inward-facing pressurized ports. So I figured, what the heck, let's have some fun with this. A 19-meter sphere, you can jam into this. That's 62 feet. Um, you can have it inflatable, so you're going to use the current trans to have uh, inflation technology. It does not need any structure because the surrounding truss provides all the structure for it, so it can be completely open. You throw your life support into the tunnels here, and you've now got this huge sphere that's open. Let me give you an idea how big this is. This room, take a look around this room. This room is half the volume of that sphere. And what can you do with that? I mean, this is so much space, it's going to be limited by only what people can think to do in there. They can have zero G soccer, cross, or maybe you want to do a waterless version of water polo. You can have fun in this thing. You can have all sorts of fun. I don't think it's big enough to start flying in, but we're getting there. Uh, you can also have a movie sound stage. Let's get the entertainment industry and start paying for some of this. It's big enough you actually start shooting full scenes in here. Um, or a zero G ballet. So, in the last uh, 29 minutes, it right, takes so long, um, I think I've described what's a, a zero G orbital hotel that is practical. You've got substantial habitable volume. You get that volume you need to have in space to make orbital resorts practical. Uh, by using standardized modules and standardized ports, you're going to drive the cost down. You're not doing everything custom anymore. Another advantage of the standardized ports is any, any launch service wants to come on the dock with you knows exactly how to do it. They've got the port. I'll give it to them. I mean, it gets people up there. 
And you can build this and launch this with current technology. We're not talking any great gross development here. This is stuff we have today. And you can launch it on the Airing 5 if you can drive those costs down enough. And you can do it. The hard part, and that's the bottom right there, is you need to get the cost for people in space. And that may be well doable if you look at some of the upstart uh, launch companies. They're looking at smaller uh, launches that take up small loads, maybe 10 people at a time, but at low cost. I can launch big hardware on the current boosters. And the little guys take the, the people up, small packages up at a low cost. That's how you can make this thing work and still have $1,000 per pound launch cost for the big hardware. Uh, it gives you great, great flexibility. It's, it's a Lincoln. Lincoln log or a logo set. You can place this thing all together any way you want to, limited by your imagination. And like I showed you earlier, you can take that one module and start making money off it while you're building the rest of it. So you have almost a near immediate revenue stream. So this is the way that I think you can you can actually go up and make this state. Yeah. <laughs> you can make this station. Couple, couple, couple short questions. If anybody has any questions, yeah. What is the uh, longevity of these transat modules? Like what maintenance are required? Oh, the question is, what's the longevity of the transat module, and what maintenance are required? Actually, these transat modules require less maintenance than the uh, aluminum modules that they're designed for the International Space Station. That's all I can talk about from now. From what I've read. The, the fabric, the uh, Kevlar, and the orbital shielding that they've got on these actually makes it more durable than the current station. So you're looking at a 10 year is a fairly realistic life cycle cost for these, or life cycle for these type of math modules. Uh, they're designing for going to Mars and back, and you're talking six years there, and they want very reliable. So it's, it's a very robust type of thing. Yes? Well, you've got six docking ports, and the biggest reason for that is you can assemble it. Once you finally get done, and, uh, on this one, you, you, you see you've got the, uh, the three modules, and you've only got really three open ports to stock, top, dock people to. So if you're running 90 people or 96 people through this every week, you're going to have a whole bunch of launches, one a day. So you're going to have all three of those full. Uh, and every single other one, you need to put the, put the station together. It's part of what gives it the flexibility, but you need that many because it is a modular assembly type thing. That's why we have some of the ports. And last one. Um, uh, life, <clears throat> life boat requirements? That is a very good question and is a very astute question because what are you going to do when I suddenly throw 130 people on order with this thing? Uh, you've got two ways you can deal with it. One, you always have some sort of uh, earth, to, or, uh, earth to orbital type vehicle back to it completely. Uh, I elected not to do that because the reason I would like to not to do that is when you get the launch services enough to uh, service a facility like this, I can get something up in a matter of like 12 to 24 hours. So what I like to do was each one of these modules, you notice I said they all had life support, they all had independent capability. So what you do, okay, this module here goes out to phooey, we've had a massive deprestoration, everybody abandon ship, you throw everybody into the other modules, close the port, undock. It's, it's a docking module, then you have, then you have a, an earthbound uh, shuttle come up, rendezvous with it, dock with it, grab the people and take them home. Well, you're going to have to put your station back together, but you haven't killed anybody. So that's how you, that's how you get around the need for a lot of life. Because in essence, the whole station is alive. OK. <laughs> Do you really trust any kind of growth mechanisms in the space station with some odd 12,000 different parts? Um, actually, uh, I mentioned earlier, I wasn't going to use a kind of birthing mechanism. Okay. Uh, Jim Lewis mentioned yesterday that they have the low impact docking system they're working on right now. Hell of a lot less parts. It's more applicable to what I want to do, and it's how I get around that particular problem. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, having you.